Hey there, all you amazing assistant principals, principals, and superintendents out there. Welcome to the deep dive where we, well, we take a deep dive into some really fascinating material and try to find those golden nuggets of knowledge that you can actually use. Mm -hmm. And today we are diving into How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking by Jordan Ellenberg. Yes. Now, great book. Before you think we're about to go, you know, full on calculus, honey, okay. relax. This book, it isn't about complex equations, really. Mm. It's more about like how mathematical thinking, the kind we use every single day, can help us be better leaders in our schools. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this deep dive is all about giving you practical tools, right? To boost your leadership game, inspire your teams, and really like make a real difference in, in student success. Okay, so what kind of math magic are we talking about here? Well, Ellenberg, he breaks down some like super interesting concepts. Um, things like survivorship bias, mm. the dangers of linear thinking, the power and pitfalls of statistics, yeah. and how understanding probability can actually help us make some of those really tough decisions. Yeah. We're going to unpack all of that and more today, and we're going to see how it connects to those core principles of school leadership that you're already rocking. Absolutely. Because let's face it, leading a school is kind of like navigating a complex equation with a ton of variables. Oh, we need all the tools we can get. Absolutely. So let's kick things off with this idea of survivorship bias. Okay. Ellenberg uses this, this incredible World War II story about statistician Abraham Wald to illustrate this. Yeah. The military, they were trying to figure out how to protect their bombers. Right. So they looked at the damage on the planes that returned from missions. Uh-huh. And they saw where all the bullet holes were concentrated. And they thought, okay, let's just reinforce those areas. Yeah. Seems logical, right? It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. here's where that bias creeps in. They were only looking at the planes that survived, uh -huh. the ones that made it back. They completely missed a crucial piece of the puzzle, the planes that were shot down. Ah, uh, the missing data. The missing data. It's like trying to solve a puzzle with, like, half the pieces missing. Exactly. Exactly. And Wald, being the brilliant mathematician that he was, he pointed this out. He said, hey, the bullet holes on the returning planes actually show us the areas where a plane can be hit and still survive. Uh. The missing bullet holes, the ones on the planes that didn't make it back, those are the areas we need to reinforce. Mind blown. I know. And now I'm thinking, how often do we do this in our schools? All the time. We look at the success stories, the schools that improved after implementing a new program. Right. But we don't always look at the schools that tried a similar program uh -huh. and didn't see those gains. We're missing half the data. You're missing a huge part of the data. And think about how this applies to, to leadership decisions, right? Yeah. Are you only looking at the teachers who are already excelling? when deciding how to allocate professional development resources? Right. Are you only analyzing data from the students who are already achieving at high levels? If so, you might be missing critical insights from those who aren't surviving the current system. That's such a good point. So what's the takeaway for our listeners? How do we avoid this trap? I mean, it's about actively seeking out the missing data. Asking those tough questions. You know, when you're evaluating a new initiative, don't just look at the positive outcomes. Ask, what about the schools or students who didn't see improvement? What can we learn from them? It's like we need to develop a, like a missing data radar, constantly scanning for those blind spots. Absolutely. And that right there is a key leadership skill. Being able to see beyond the obvious, right? To dig deeper and find those hidden pieces of the puzzle. That's how you make truly informed decisions. Yeah. Okay, on to the next big idea, linear thinking. Ellenberg brings up the Laffer curve, which basically suggests that there's a sweet spot when it comes to things like tax rates. Lowering taxes can be good for the economy, but lowering them too much can actually backfire. Right, right, right. It's a perfect example of nonlinear thinking. It's not a straight line. It's a curve meaning there's a point of diminishing returns. Exactly. And this is where it gets really interesting for us in education. We often fall into that linear thinking trap. Oh, yeah. We assume that more of something automatically equals better results. More homework, more standardized tests, longer school days. Right. More, more, more. But just like the Laffer curve, there's a point where that extra stuff might not be translating into meaningful gains for our students. Yeah. In fact, it might even be doing more harm than good. Absolutely. Think about those professional development days where you're bombarded with information from 8.00.00.00 p.m. Right. At some point, everyone's brains are fried and they're not retaining anything. 
Exactly. And that's the challenge for leaders. It's about recognizing that not all relationships are linear. Sometimes less is more. It really is. Yeah. So for all you amazing school leaders out there, I want you to ask yourself this. Are there areas where you've been assuming a linear relationship, where you've been operating under that more is always better mindset? Yeah. Maybe it's time to take a closer look and consider the possibility that hitting that sweet spot, that optimal point, might actually lead to better outcomes for everyone. Yeah, I think that's a great point to end on. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to tackle the wild world of statistics. All right, sounds good. So that's such a critical point, and it leads us perfectly into the next idea that Ellenberg tackles, the world of statistics. Ah, yes. Statistics, the heart and soul of data-driven decision-making. Right. But also a potential minefield if we're not careful. Absolutely. And one of the biggest pitfalls that Ellenberg highlights is the danger of misinterpreting statistics, especially when we're dealing with small sample sizes. Okay, this is where that, that law of large numbers comes in, right? The idea that the more times you repeat something, the closer those results get to the expected outcome. Precisely. Think about it like this. If you flip a coin 10 times, you might get a weird result. Right. Like, yeah. you know, seven heads and three tails. Not exactly a 50-50 split. Right. But if you flip that coin a thousand times, you're going to get much closer to that expected 50-50 ratio. So how does this play out in the real world of school leadership? Well, consider how we often evaluate teachers based on a single year of test scores. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty small sample size, a snapshot in time. Just like those 10 coin flips, there's a lot of room for, for random variation, <laughs> for factors outside the teacher's control to influence those results. It's like judging a basketball player's entire career based on one game. Exactly. And that's where we can fall into a trap as leaders. We see those test scores and we, we jump to conclusions. Right. We label teachers as, you know, high performing or needs improvement based on limited data. And it's, it's like those, you know, early season NBA stats. Right. The guys with the highest shooting percentages might just be the ones who got lucky with a few shots. That's a great analogy. And as the season progresses, those percentages tend to even out to reflect their true skill level more accurately. So what's the solution here? How do we avoid making those, you know, those hasty judgments? It's about taking a more holistic view of teacher performance, looking at multiple years of data, multiple sources of information, okay. classroom observations, student feedback, peer reviews, professional growth, all of these things contribute to a much richer picture of a teacher's effectiveness. So it's about moving away from that, you know, gotcha mentality and towards a more kind of supportive, growth-oriented approach. Absolutely. And that shift in thinking is essential for creating a culture of trust and continuous improvement within your school. It really is. So instead yeah. of focusing on those, you know, those isolated data points, we need to zoom out and see the bigger picture. That's right. And this leads us to another crucial aspect of statistical thinking, understanding the difference between correlation and causation. Ah, uh, yes, that old chestnut. Yeah. Just because two things are related doesn't mean one causes the other. Right. And this is where things can get really, really tricky, especially when we're trying to make sense of educational research. Yeah. We see these studies that show correlations between certain factors and student outcomes. Uh -huh. And it's tempting to jump to conclusions. But as Ellenberg points out, we need to be very cautious about assuming a causal link. Very cautious. He gives this great example of, of the correlation between, between carrying a lighter and getting lung cancer. Right. Obviously, carrying a lighter doesn't cause cancer. Right. It's the smoking that's the real culprit. It's the behavior. But sometimes those correlations can be, can be misleading especially in education. Oh, for sure. Think about the correlation between socioeconomic status and test scores. Yeah. It's a, it's a well-established relationship. Yeah. But does that mean, you know, being from a from a lower socioeconomic background directly causes lower test scores? Right. Not necessarily. There right. could be a whole host of other factors at play. Absolutely. Access to resources, quality of instruction, even things like stress and trauma. Oh, yeah. And that's and that's where those those critical thinking skills come in, right? Absolutely. As leaders, you need to be able to kind of dissect those those research findings to identify potential confounding factors. It's about asking those probing questions. Is there a causal link here? What other factors might be influencing these results? Is this research even applicable to our specific 
school community. Yeah. It's about understanding the nuances of research, recognizing its limitations, and using it as one piece of a larger puzzle, not as the sole basis for decision making. It's not about, you know, dismissing research altogether, but about approaching it with a healthy dose of skepticism. Yeah, yeah exactly. And this is where collaboration becomes so important engage your team in those discussions, challenge each other's assumptions, and make sure you're looking at the data from multiple angles. Because ultimately it's about using data to inform our decisions, not to dictate them. Right. And that's a key principle of effective leadership. Absolutely. Using data as a tool, a guide, but not letting it become the be all and end all. Yeah. That's, I mean, this this deep dive is really making me think differently about how I approach data and research. It's like putting on a new pair of glasses. It is. Yeah. And that's the power of, of mathematical thinking. It gives you a new lens through which to view the world. A lens that can help us make more informed decisions, avoid those common pitfalls, and ultimately create a better learning environment for our students. I love that. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to explore the fascinating world of probability and risk. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so we talked about survivorship bias. Yeah. We've talked about linear thinking and the importance of, you know, really understanding statistics. But I feel like there's like one more big piece of the puzzle we need to talk about. Yeah. And that's probability. You're absolutely right. And this is where things get even more interesting, I think, for school leaders. Because we're constantly making decisions with uncertain outcomes. Right. It's true. Yeah. Whether we're, you know, launching a new initiative, allocating resources, or even just like hiring new staff, yeah. we're always dealing with a certain degree of risk. Oh, absolutely. For sure. And Ellenberg introduces this concept of expected value, which is a way to think about those uncertain situations in a more mathematical way. Okay. Break that down for me. What exactly is expected value? So it's essentially a way to weigh the potential gains and losses of a decision against kind of their likelihood. So it helps you make a more informed choice when the outcome isn't guaranteed. Okay. So it's not just about hoping for the best case scenario, right? It's about considering all the possibilities and their probabilities. Mm -hmm. So it's like a more data-driven way to make those tough decisions. Precisely. And it can be incredibly helpful, especially when you're faced with limited resources and competing priorities. Expected value can help you determine, you know, where to invest your time, your energy, your funding for the greatest potential impact. So how do we actually apply this in a school setting? Like, it still feels a little bit abstract to me. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Think about it like this. Let's say you have to choose between two after-school programs. Okay. One focuses on STEM skills and the other on arts education. Both have the potential to benefit students. Right. But you only have the funding for one. That's a tough choice. Mm -hmm. How do you decide? Well, this is where that expected value can come in. Oh. You gather as much data as possible about each program, right? Uh -huh. Things like potential student outcomes, cost, staffing needs, community interest. Okay. And then you try to estimate the probability of each program actually achieving its goals. Exactly. You might find that the STEM program has a higher potential for improving test scores, right? Yeah. But it also has a higher cost, and it requires specialized teachers who are difficult to find. Right. And the arts program might have you know, a lower potential for directly impacting test scores, but a higher probability of success because it's, you know, it's easier to implement and has strong community support. Right. By weighing those potential gains and losses against their likelihood, you can get a clear sense of which program has the higher expected value. Okay. And that can help you make a more informed and strategic decision. That's a really helpful way to frame it. It's like, it's like adding a layer of mathematical reasoning to those like gut level decisions we often have to make. Exactly. And it can also help you communicate those decisions to your team and stakeholders. By explaining the expected value analysis, you can show that you're not just making, you know, arbitrary choices. Yeah. You're making calculated decisions based on data and careful consideration of potential outcomes. So this whole deep dive has really highlighted the importance of of mathematical thinking for school leaders. Oh, absolutely. It's not just about, you know, crunching numbers. It's not. It's about approaching problems in a logical, analytical, and data-informed way. For sure. It's about, you know, seeing patterns, assessing risks, and making those those tough choices with more, you know, confidence and clarity. Right. And and ultimately it's about using those skills to create a better learning environment for for all students. I love that. Yeah. Well, I think we've successfully unpacked some serious knowledge nuggets from how not to be wrong. We did it. I know I'm walking away with a whole new perspective on on how mathematical thinking 
can help me be a more effective leader. Me too. And I hope our listeners feel the same way. So to all you amazing assistant principals, principals and superintendents out there, keep asking those tough questions. Keep seeking out that missing data and keep diving deep into the world of knowledge because that's how we make a real difference in the lives of our students. Couldn't have said it better myself. And on that note, we'll wrap up this episode of The Deep Dive. Until next time.